you guys are here for the Rain Garden 101. So welcome. Um, I'm a district technician here at the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. You've all been muted off the bat here. Um, please stay muted until the end of the presentation. Then we'll have some time for some questions and answers. Um, other than that, I'm gonna hand things over to Franny and she's gonna get you off and going here tonight. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Franny Jurdy with the Sherburne Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm the urban conservationist. Uh, so thank you for joining our rain garden talk. Um, it is a, about a 35 minute uh, recording. So if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use that chat window. Um, if it's a short question, I'll try to answer it during the presentation. But if it's something that may require a little lengthier response, we can wait until after the presentation where we'll have um, plenty of time for a question and answer session. So um, with that, like David said, you're all muted um, and you guys can keep your videos off. Um, but feel free to unmute yourself if you want to if you want to voice a question at the end of the session. Um, so with that, I think we are going to get things going. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Rain Garden 101 presentation as part of our conservation webinar series. We're going to be learning what a rain garden is and how we can install one. Um, on your property uh, to help mitigate some stormwater runoff. So let's get right into it. So first of all, what is a rain garden? Um, I feel like rain gardens have become quite popular ever since uh, the mid 2000s. It's becoming more of a common word people will hear in the landscaping business. And basically rain garden is meant to mimic nature's way of infiltrating water. So you usually direct some kind of um, runoff from hard surfaces like a rooftop or a driveway or a sidewalk and it's meant to go into the rain garden that is usually a you know a shallow depression no more than six to eight inches in residential settings with a flat bottom and then gradual side slopes and so um, once the water is directed into it after a rain event it tends to fill up and it'll infiltrate so the water will soak into the ground within 24 to 48 hours. That's how they're designed. So there isn't any concern about um, mosquitoes, you know, breeding or adding mosquitoes to the population there. Um, so the water will infiltrate into the ground. The plants that are in the rain garden will, um, you know, take up some of that water. Um, some of it will also go into the groundwater and then some water will be evaporated through the plant's leaves and things like that. So some reasons why we want to include rain gardens on our property is that it helps reduce runoff from leaving the property. It's kind of one of the main reasons we like to incorporate rain gardens. Um, it helps filter pollutants. Um, so the plants will take up any excess nutrients um, from that water um, instead of having it run off into uh, you know, your, your storm drains and into surface waters causing some issues that we'll talk about a little later. They also provide uh, great wildlife habitat and pollinator habitat because we usually incorporate um, flowering plants and grasses into rain gardens. And so those flowers are, you know, great nectar and pollen sources for pollinators and the, the plants provide uh, nesting habitat and shelter for other wildlife. It creates less lawn to mow. So, you know, usually you're planting a rain garden um, uh, and taking out grass um, so you, you don't have to um, put as much time into your lawn in that area. And they're also very aesthetically pleasing because they utilize flowers and grasses that, that look really nice and um, usually are, something is blooming all season long. So our conventional urban drainage you know, systems were designed to move water off our property and off the streets as fast as possible. Obviously, you know, for, for very specific reasons, we don't want our streets flooded um, and having standing water that would make things very difficult. But um, also our, our systems are a little outdated these days because there's been a lot of increased impervious surfaces and they haven't been updated to incorporate that, you know, larger houses, wider streets, more driveway, more sidewalk, things like that. Um, and those hard surfaces 
when water runs off of them into the street, they pick up whatever's in the way. So, you know, fertilizer grains that haven't been swept up, sand, salt from winter time, you know, grass clippings, debris, other things like that, trash. They all end up in the street. They all, you know, get taken away by the water. And once they're in the storm sewer, those usually lead to the nearest surface water. So a lake, a river, um, wetland, maybe a stormwater pond in a neighborhood. And in that, that water's untreated. It doesn't go to a wastewater treatment facility like our faucets um, and showers do. And so whatever the water picks up um, when it's flowing over those hard surfaces ends up in our lakes and rivers. And that causes some water quality issues. Um, you know, if there's uh, a lot of excess sediment or, or sand that can make the water cloudy, um, makes it for um, uh, difficult recreating. It's not great for our aquatic organisms. Uh, also, um, the water can pick up fertilizer or grass clippings, leaves, other organic debris like that, which when um, they get carried into a lake. They can help feed those algae populations, which turn the lakes green in the summertime, uh, which makes recreation very unfavorable and it can cause odor issues and even health issues. Some algae can um, produce toxins like blue-green algae uh, that if consumed enough by people, we can get sick. We There's usually not a, a fatality worry there, but um, it can be um, fatal to uh, our, our pets, so like dogs, you know, and you can't tell a dog not to drink lake water when they're swimming, it's impossible. Um, so there's, there's concern with that more than just a water quality concern. So just a little background of, you know, why we like to um, incorporate rain gardens, um, how they can help our neighborhoods. So let's get into um, picking out where we want a rain garden, how we install one. So when selecting a location for a rain garden, there are a few options. Some um, will require a little more um, construction uh, or, or creative ways to help divert the water uh, into the rain garden. But there are some easy ways to do that too. So basically installing a rain garden at a base of a rooftop downspout is a pretty common way. Um, to divert water there. You already have that um, uh, downspout arm reaching out um, towards the rain garden. You can buy extenders and they have ones with elbows and everything. So you can create your own way to get the water into the rain garden. So that's pretty easy. Uh, another place to put a rain garden is, is simply on a downslope of a lawn. Um, maybe your house is sitting up a little higher than the the bottom area of your lawn right before the street um, and you know water flows to this one specific area so you can place your rain garden there um, especially if there's a nice bit of lawn the water can flow through to kind of slow it down before it really gets into the rain garden um, that makes things pretty easy and you can just utilize gravity to get the water to go where it needs to go. Um, boulevard or street side rain gardens um, are great places to get water from the street, um, but you usually need to do a little more construction work. Um, you have to do some kind of curb cut if there are if there are curbs um, in your on your street. Uh, you have to cut the curb and um, put in a apron and you know redo the curb so it um, directs the water into the rain garden. Um, but it. It, it, it does a really good job of, of taking care of that street runoff. Um, so some areas that we want to avoid um, putting a rain garden in, you want to keep it at least 10 feet from a foundation um, just to avoid you know, any potential flooding of basements or things like that. I haven't heard any examples of that happening, but it's just better to be on the safe side. Um, you want to avoid areas with multiple bare utilities. Uh, mainly, you just don't want to, you know, dig around areas with a lot of utilities and, and putting in plants with deep roots that maybe you want to avoid doing that. You want to avoid planting under large mature trees, mainly because uh, you could damage the tree roots when you're digging the rain garden itself. Um, and then if the tree has seeds, you're just going to be battling little seedlings coming up in the rain garden and that could turn into a headache. 
Um, you want to avoid putting a rain garden on or near a septic tank or drain field. Um, I believe you have to keep infiltration practices with at least 50 feet away from um, those types of things just to be safe. You don't want to overload the drain field with any more water than what is already going there. Um, and you want to avoid putting a rain garden near um, a drinking water supply well. So if you live in a city and you don't have a, you know, a, a septic tank or a well to get your water, um, you're hooked up to the city water, then you don't need to worry about things like that. But uh, if you are in a more rural setting with those obstacles to consider, you just want to keep those in mind. And then lastly, you don't want to put a rain garden either in the middle of a steep slope or at the very base of a steep slope. Um, there's just some concern with um, erosion, depending on how steep the slope is. There could be quite a velocity of water flowing down there and um, that could potentially wash out the rain garden. Putting it um, on a gradual slope is just fine. So let's take a look at this property here um, and go through some examples of places to avoid um, and kind of get you in that mindset of, uh, you know, how to think about where you want to rain, a rain garden to go. So the first thing on the slide before was um, 10 feet from a foundation. So I'm, uh, we have a house and a garage here. I just put a box around both of them um, with, that, are, that are 10 foot from the foundations of where a rain garden could possibly go. So we'll avoid putting a rain garden inside either one of those boxes. Next, we have uh, buried utilities. So here we have a water and gas line. Um, so we want to avoid putting a rain garden over that so we don't have to dig around that. And this is uh, a property in the city, so they have above ground power, so you don't have to worry about buried power. But if you do have buried power lines, you want to keep that in mind. And then we want to avoid burying or placing a rain garden um, under a mature tree. So we have a couple trees here that are outlined, so we want to just avoid um, going near those circles. So in this image, we have a couple spots that are open, but there's one area where we're actually going to get some kind of um, runoff to take care of. So that roof runoff um, in the front yard there, uh, we can easily direct into that rain garden. And the rain garden has nice open space, um, plenty of sun, so we can plant some nice sun loving flowers. So that's kind of the things you wanna consider when looking at your property and figuring out a place to put a rain garden. Now we have to figure out the size of the rain garden we need to take care of all the water that is going to be directed towards it. And so in order to, to figure out the size, we kind of need two different numbers. One is a soil factor number, and I can include um, the resource that uh, I got this information um, uh, after the presentation. I can email everyone some resources. So for determining your soil factor number, um, you need to obviously know what kind of soil you have, or at least a general um, general idea. So I broke down soil types into these three very broad categories. Um, so we have sandy, silty, and clay. And if you live in Sherburne County, you most likely have sandy. Um, Sherburne is just a notoriously sandy county. So um, when determining soil, you want to you can determine it based off of its texture, its feel. So if you have a soil that's gritty and coarse, it is most likely sandy. If it is a little smooth, but not sticky, and uh, usually it's a little darker in color, you know, you can tell it has a little more organic material in it. It is um, silty. And if it's sticky and clumpy, so you can almost like form it into a, a ball in your hand, it's most likely clayey. So in our example here, I have silty soil. And um, you see on the top of this chart, it has depth inches. Um, so that's how deep you want your rain garden. So you can kind of choose um, this, the depth that you want. So if you want it pretty shallow, um, there's that three to five inch category, and then you can go up to eight inches and that'll, that'll change how big your rain garden is. So if it's more shallow, it could be a little bigger than if the rain garden is a little more deeper. So my soil factor number, um, I'm going to choose three to five inch depth and I have silty soil. So my soil factor number is 0.34. So let's remember that number. So next, um, the next number in this equation to figure out the size is our drainage area. So the area that is being directed into our rain garden. 
So here's where my rain garden is in that front yard that we picked out earlier. And this is the drainage area that's going to my rain garden. So it's just this half of the roof, um, which is 400 square feet. And you can measure area in Google Maps these days. Or if you've been on the Sherburne County Beacon website, you can also, also measure from there. And so we have 400 square feet. So I'm going to multiply that by that soil factor number, 0.34. So that gets me a square footage of 360 or 136 square feet. So that is the size of my rain garden. So it's, it's pretty small. Uh, you know, that's like a little over 100 by 100, uh, or 10 by 10 square. Um, so then we have to figure out how many plants we want to put in our rain garden. And we typically recommend um, a one and a half foot space thing. That's usually a, a pretty common guide um, when installing plants. Um, but you know, it depends. If you're using bigger plants, then you can space them out a little further. But the, the size that you normally get at native nurseries, um, this one and a half foot spacing is a pretty good um, place to start. So I got another little chart here with kind of um, factor numbers. So if you'll see the spacing planned is in the left column and then you have to divide by this factor um, in the right column. So we have the one and a half foot spacing, the second number down. So we use that 2.2 um, to divide our, our square footage of our rain garden. So I have 136 square feet divided by 2.22. So that gets me 61.26. But since you can't have 0.26 of a plant, I'm rounding down to 60. And it's, it's good to have the total number of plants divisible by six because a lot of native nurseries carry their plants in packs of six. So it just makes it a lot easier when buying plants if you have that number already divisible by six. So you need obviously six of one plant um, to make that work. So now let's get into the plants a little more. Um, we, let, we recommend using native plants because of their various benefits. Um, like I mentioned earlier, they provide habitat for pollinators and wildlife. As you can see, they, the flowering parts are really great pollen and nectar sources. Uh, the seeds of the flowers can be used by birds throughout this, the winter months. Um, and the grasses and even flowers can be used as nesting or, or shelter for other wildlife. But a lot of the magic with native plants is happening below ground, as you can see from this picture. Their root systems are quite incredible. Um, some of them go, you know, more than 15 feet deep. Uh, there's really long tap roots. There's super dense fibrous root systems from the grasses. And all of those different types of root structures really work together um, to not only stabilize the soil, but they create channels to infiltrate water. Um, they, you know, fill in gaps um, where there are no plants to prevent uh, weeds from taking over and they create really great habitat for microorganisms in the soil um, and that really helps to increase um, soil organic matter which um, creates a lot healthier soils and if we have healthier soils we're going to have healthier plants and i have a comparison over here um, that little red circle has turf grass in it um, and so you can kind of compare that with the native plants and maybe get a feel for why turf grass uh, needs watering and fertilizer and aeration, you know, a couple times a season because it just, it can't provide for itself because their root systems are so short. Um, and Kentucky bluegrass is probably one of the most common lawn grasses. They're not quite adapted to our, to Minnesota's climate. Um, you think of where it's from, it's, you know, the UK is kind of where um, lawn grass comes from. And so it's usually a little more mild, uh, cooler, and then it has a lot of rain. You know, their winters are mostly rainy instead of snowy like us. Um, and so that's what Kentucky bluegrass likes. And so that's why you'll notice it, um, you know, turn brown in the summer here when it's really hot and dry. That's, it's, it's just going dormant. That's what its life cycle is and it can't handle that heat. And so that's why it usually greens up again in the fall because the temperatures have dropped a little more. Um, so that's why it requires a lot of input um, to keep it healthy because 
it's just not adaptable to our climate here, like these native plants are. And so they don't require, they don't require fertilizer. They do not require water once they're established. So they're just a lot easier to uh, maintain. And they provide a lot more than what turf grass can provide in terms of uh, habitat. So there are a lot of great options of native plants. Um, I feel like there's a lot of misconception for what a native plant is um, and how they look. Um, but once you get into it, uh, you'll, you'll find that there's just great variety in terms of shapes and colors and heights um, and textures and all of those good things. Um, so you can usually find something that you like to incorporate uh, into your landscape. So here are some examples for dry, sunny sites. So like that example we have of my rain garden in the front yard, I would probably look at a selection of, of these plants to include in there because it's nice and sunny. But there's also plenty of options for um, shady sites as well, as long as it's you know, not directly under a tree. Um, lots of different um, flowers or even just um, greenery like ferns um, to provide nice colors and textures throughout the season. Also, there's a lot of great ground cover options too. Um, plants for wet sites. So I mentioned that a rain garden usually has a flat basin where water will um, fill up during rain events. Um, so it's not necessarily suggesting wetland plants, but plants that can handle a little bit of water inundation um, whenever there's a rain event. So think of plants that you might find along a stream, a stream bank. Um, you know, the water fluctuates quite often in rivers based on rainfall. And so those plants are used to being a little underwater at times, then also being um, pretty dry at times when the, the rivers are pretty low. So there's plenty of options to include there that would look nice as well. And then lastly, it is always good to include grasses and sedges, uh, like I mentioned before in the slide with their roots. Um, they, they help fill in those gaps um, to prevent weeds. And they also provide structure above ground um, to help support the flowers, to keep them upright um, and to keep the garden looking lush kind of in between um, when flowers are blooming. Um, and there's a lot of options to choose from for native grasses that, that look really nice. Um, so when, um, when you're planting a rain garden, um, I kind of, you know, touched on this. There, you have the side slopes where that's where you're gonna put your more dry um, loving plants because uh, the side slopes won't get as inundated with water as down in the basin. So those are mainly there to help provide stability on those side slopes. And then in the basin, that's where you're gonna want to um, include those plants that can handle infrequent inundation. So let's go over the installation process real quick. Um, step one is, um, getting your utilities marked, uh, Gopher State One is a really easy resource to use. Nowadays, you can just go online and punch in your address and when your project is taking place and um, they, they get out to market pretty quickly. That's definitely the first thing you wanna do if you're doing any kind of digging project. I cannot stress that enough. So once you have the area that you want to um, install your rain garden, you wanna mark it out, you wanna mark out both the edges, like the way the edge and then where the edge of the basin is gonna be. Um, because then when you dig, you can dig out the basin first and dig it down to the depth you need. And then you can um, gradually dig down the side slopes to meet the basin. Um, so you, you keep that depth even um, at what you want it to be. So whatever that, so mine was the three to five inch depth. And in some cases, um, you might need to over excavate. It, if your soil is you know, pretty sandy, so it infiltrates fairly well, then you might not need to. But in this case, uh, this property was really compacted and was having drainage problems to begin with. So we over excavated by two feet and then we filled it back in, but kept that you know, eight inch ponding depth with a soil amendment that was a mixture of sand and compost. And you can, you can find those at a lot of um, landscapers these days. They have rain garden specific soil mixes uh, to make it pretty easy to utilize that. And so we filled it back up with this soil mix. So it was um, ready to go for mulch. So we included mulch. Um, and if, you, if you're including mulch, 
which we usually recommend two to three inches, you have to incorporate that into your depth. So if you want an eight inch depth, but you're gonna put in two inches of mulch, then you need to dig down two inches further than you would. So you really, you need to do a 10 inch depth and then you fill up those two inches with mulch to get that eight inch depth. And it's a lot easier to put down mulch first and plant into the mulch than it is to plant and put mulch around all the baby plants because they're small. If you see this picture here, it shows a couple of four inch pots. And then there's also all those little plugs that are sticking out came from a six pack. So they're, you know, just kind of a one inch plug. So they, they are very small once you put them in the ground. So a lot easier to mulch first. So you add your plants according to your design, keeping the dry things on the side slope and the wet plants in the basin. And then you're done. And you can, you know, there's an option of, you know, putting in edging, making it look a little more formal or intentional. Um, you can jazz it up however you want. So here are some examples of um, pretty established backyard gardens. And, you know, you can design them to fit in with your current landscaping. So you really can't tell that they are rain gardens, especially once the plants fill in and get taller and, and fuller. Uh, it's really hard to see that it, there is any kind of depth to the rain garden. Um, and obviously the one with the snow fence around it is pretty obvious. They kept that snow fence to keep their dogs out while the plants were getting established. Um, so some street side examples, um, you can tell the ones on the left have that curb cut that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that can um, be a little costly, um, uh, but it's definitely doable if you want um, a street side rain garden. Um, and then the one on the top here was just um, in, a, in, a, in a ditch. Um, and so the water's just sheet flowing off of the side of the street into the rain garden. And I thought I would just quickly mention other um, practices to help mitigate stormwater in case uh, you don't necessarily have enough space for a rain garden, but you still want to help reduce the stormwater from leaving your property. So a uh, rain barrel is a, a great option, uh, pretty low maintenance, pretty easy to install. You just uh, might have to do a little um, fitting with your gutter to make it fit. Um, but so you can use the the water on, you know, potted plants and in your the rest of your landscaping. It's just recommended not to use on um, a vegetable garden um, or anything that you might be eating because the water isn't necessarily the cleanest if it's coming from your roof. Uh, another option would be a French drain or a dry well. And it's just a really fancy a uh, word for a uh, buried rock trench. And so you basically um, over excavate uh, a trench, um, maybe leading to kind of a bigger area with the dry well. Um, and there are some pretty fancy systems you can buy to do this, um, or you can, um, you know, like this looks like they're just using a 50 gallon drum uh, as their dry well. And there's usually some kind of inlet, like there's this catch basin uh, great here um, that's probably right next to a driveway or something or you can have these right at the bottom of a, a downspout um, and then you cover that rock trench up with filter fabric you can cover the filter fabric up with with soil and grass seed so it's completely hidden all you would see is that catch basin um, and so it's just meant to infiltrate the water and fill up those rock pores um, to allow infiltration over time and it's actually a really great thing to do in Sherburn where we have such sandy soil. So infiltration is usually really good. And then lastly, um, if you're gonna, you know, redo a sidewalk or a driveway or a patio, um, using pervious pavement is a really good option um, to help reduce the amount of um, runoff um, coming off of your property. I'm not gonna go over all of these different layers because we are running out of time here, um, but it's typically, several layers of different size um, gravel and rock and then um, the pavers are put down and then those gaps between the pavers are filled with um, some kind of like pea gravel like a really fine gravel and so the the purpose of it is to you know in those gaps where there's the rock it it filters water um, down that those layers of rock um, and then into the native soil and so it looks, you know, it looks really nice. It looks just like a regular um, paver setup. Um, it just allows for water to infiltrate 
versus the other paver setups where they sometimes even have like a joint compound. So it's completely pervious or impervious. Um, and I've been to demonstrations where I've seen people tip over a 50 gallon bucket of water and it disappears instantly. So they're a really great practice to help reduce stormwater runoff. So real quickly, um, a couple of resources that um, are really great to check out. Uh, I can send these resources after the presentation as well. So you don't necessarily have to copy down all of these web addresses. Um, but Blue Thumb is a really great organization that has uh, lots of information about rain gardens and also other uh, native planting options on their website. If you um, aren't sure where to get native plants, the Minnesota DNR has a native plant supplier list. You can search by region and it'll show all of the different um, plant suppliers in that area. And a lot of those um, companies are also uh, landscape installers so they can, they can come out and install a rain garden for you, um, even do maintenance as well. Um, the, the Minnesota Wildflower website is a great resource for learning about the native flowers of Minnesota. Uh, I go on that all the time during the field season. You can look up flowers by color, by um, bloom time, by region. Um, and they just have really great pictures of all of the different stages of the plant and um, the types of habitat that they are usually found in. And it also has non-native and um, noxious weeds. So if you find something in your yard and you wanna look it up, and you see, oh, this is actually a noxious weed, I should pull it. Um, a great website to start with for that. And then lastly, the Wisconsin DNR has this really great manual um, for rain garden installation um, for landowners. Um, it's a pretty big document, but it's got really good step-by-step -step guidelines on how to install a rain garden from start to finish. Um, and I can include this PDF um, in an email after this presentation as well. So that is all I have. So now I think we're going to have some time for questions. Um, if, if you've been asking in the chat um, and I haven't been able to get to it, I will get to that now. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you learned something. Um, now's your chance. Feel free to throw some questions in the chat or unmute yourself. Before you unmute yourself, we're going to start off with one question we got here in the chat. So um, are there any setbacks from sidewalks? I guess we'll get the page up first before we let Franny answer here. Yeah. So can everybody hear me now? I think I'm unmuted. Um, there aren't any like guidelines, I would say, on setbacks from sidewalks. Um, there might be in, you know, specific cities, they could have some kind of rule, like for a, like a pedestrian sidewalk um, in a city setting. Um, but if you're just thinking of your residential sidewalk, like a sidewalk from your front door to your um, driveway, there aren't any guidelines for that. It's probably just recommended to use shorter plants, kind of like right along where the sidewalk is. So you don't have taller plants flopping over um, into your sidewalk. That's kind of the biggest thing. Thanks, Franny. Um, got a question from Joni. Um, does the paver system show, redu show and reduce the amount of impervious soil? For instance, if I wanted to increase the size of my house and my lot does not have enough pervious soil right now, what if I made the patio, or what if I made my patio this paver system with drainage? Would this satisfy? So let me, and I, and I know that that's not a rain garden question, but you showed that and it just made me think of it. So, so are Sorry. you, are you thinking like, are you for like a lake lot where you need to have like 25%? Absolutely a lake lot. Yes, <laughs> ma'am. <laughs> yes. So we've, we've, yeah, we've had that question quite a bit and that varies from county to county, whether a county will um, consider pervious pavers, like a, a, you know, a pervious um, system versus impervious. And I believe right now, Sherburne County does not consider pervious pavers like a reduction of your impervious surface area. Thank um, you. I've, I've had a few chats with them about that. And their reasoning is um, they, pervious pavers do need to be maintained, like they need to be cleaned regularly. Otherwise they can 
clog up and act like um, impervious pavers. So their worry is if you know they allow people to do that, but they're not maintained, then it's not really um, benefiting the the lot for for a, a lake setting uh, specifically. So thank long so long much. answer to that question. No, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? When's the best time of year to plant a rain garden? Did Good you question. Um, you know, I think spring or fall, you mainly just want to avoid, you know, the, the summer months when it's really hot. Um, sometimes I've heard fall is even better just because of the cooler temperatures um, and you don't need to worry about watering throughout the entire growing season that year. Um, but spring or fall would be would be good either way. And if you guys uh, don't have any questions right now and you're thinking about something later tonight, uh, feel free. We'll have our contact information right here. Um, otherwise, um, more questions. I have, I have one last question. Maybe it's not the last one, but um, is there a way to make this slide deck available to us? I don't know, maybe you talked about that, but how would we get a copy of this uh, slide deck? Yeah, we're going to have, um, so the SWCD, we have a YouTube channel if, you, if you've never checked it out. Um, and we will eventually have this presentation up there and I might try to fix the little blender we had <laughs> in the middle of the presentation. I apologize for that. Um, so you'll have the whole presentation without a silent. Section. I think those charts would be helpful yes. to have. And, yeah. and I will, um, I have the documents where those charts came from with a little more explanation on how they were used. Um, so I can send that to everybody um, that signed up for this talk. I have another question. So like what kind of long-term maintenance, like in 10 years or yep. so do you need to do with the rain garden? That's a great question. So basically you, you have to do annual maintenance, you know, just like any garden. Um, if you get a lot of leaf debris, uh, you wanna get that out just so it doesn't end up clogging up the rain garden. Um, you can clip back things, you know, um, clip back stems in the spring like you normally would. Uh, in the, the biggest area that you want to make sure is kept clean regularly is where the water is flowing into the rain garden, so the inlet. Um, so if that's kept clean, um, then that'll help um, extend the life um, of your rain garden. And so a couple pictures showed kind of like a device, it's called the rain guardian. It looked like a, a storm grate almost. Um, those have filters in them and they're, they're being used more and more these days to just keep larger debris out of your rain garden and clean, clean up a lot easier. But if you have just like a lawn that's being directed into your rain garden, as long as you're maintaining that lawn, you know, keeping debris out of the way, um, that's, that's good enough. And there's not a whole lot of, of research yet on like how long rain gardens really last. I mean, some of the oldest rain gardens are probably almost 20 years old by now and they're still functioning. Um, so as long as you just, you know, keep up with your regular maintenance, there's nothing um, serious that needs to happen like in the long term. Yeah, because I was thinking maybe you have to go back and do some extra planting you know, after a while yeah, or anything yeah. that may not, like that's just kind of, I don't know, with, with different climate change and different things that's going on, maybe something, or maybe an insect got to something and you have to go back and, and add some plants back in or, or maybe some plants got too big, mm -hmm. you know, and aren't being as a, well, yeah. I, I yeah. don't know, are they still effective if they're really, <laughs> you know, 
gotten pretty bushy and taken over, yeah. you know? So I guess that's just kind of like your normal gardening. Yeah, it kind of is. And yeah, they're, I mean, you kind of do want them to get filled in because then, I mean, there's less weeding, um, but then you, you know, there's a lot of root system below ground uh, really, you know, helping to infiltrate the water. So that's good. Uh, there's, you know, there's always a chance, you know, certain plant species might not last as long. So like black eyed Susans are a pretty short lived flower. Um, so, you know, after a few years, if they just don't seem to be coming back, you can easily replace them um, with maybe another plant or you can try something new. Um, but yeah, pretty, pretty typical of a, of a regular garden. My neighbors um, right across the road um, have a one that they planted, I, I'm guessing like 15 years ago, or it's been a while, but like, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, All they're the well maintained. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, like David said, you can you can see my email there. You probably already have my email from um, getting the Zoom links and everything. So you can always shoot me a question. Uh, we will let you know when this presentation is available on our YouTube channel. Um, so I think with that, unless anybody has any last minute burning questions, we can, um, we can end the presentation for the night. And thank you so much uh, for all who had joined. I know it was a beautiful evening, so it's probably really tempting to, to get outside, but we appreciate you joining us for the evening. Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you, you all. Friend.